Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus, and Lord, we're so grateful we can come into your house, that we can lift our hearts, lift our hands, God, that we can walk in sacrificial obedience to you. Tonight, Lord, as we open up your word, we pray that you open it up to us, open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, open our hearts to have a good understanding. God, tonight, impart grace to the hearers, Lord. Father, as we hear your word, God, may it produce faith in each and every one of us. May it grow into fruition, God, and may we just be blessed, God. May we receive the fruit of those things which we have planted in our hearts and in our lives tonight, God. Lord, we would invite your Holy Spirit and welcome your Holy Spirit to be our teacher, be our guide. Give us your vision, your wisdom, your instruction, your direction, even the correction we need for our lives, Lord. We'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. God, tonight we recognize that it's not a man or a woman, not the young or the old, not a black man, white man, brown man, tall man, short man. Any of those types of things, God, we came to hear from you. So Holy Spirit, welcome in this place. Speak to our hearts. Bless our lives, Lord God. And also, Lord, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. We'd ask it for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet that are both preaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask that you would bless them as you would bless us tonight, God. Bless the Baptists, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals. We beg you for Calvary Chapel Harvest, for Oak Valley, for Ecclesia and Trinity and Emmanuel Baptist, for the Way, for Victory and all the Assemblies of God, for the Four Square Denominations, for our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters. Lord, if they're preaching your gospel truth, lifting up your name, we bless them as you would bless us. God, also, we don't forget our persecuted brothers and sisters scattered abroad throughout the world. Lord, we would ask that you comfort them, strengthen them, encourage them, protect them, guide them, and direct them, Lord. Deliver them, Lord. And Father, may they endure to the end to the glory of God. We give you praise and thanks tonight. In Jesus' my name, everybody in agreement said? Amen. Amen. All right. Have a seat tonight. Get your Bibles out and go with me once again to Galatians, the fifth chapter. Uh, last time I, I mentioned that Anytime I'm ministering on a night's service, I'm going to start uh, just ministering out of Galatians, the fifth chapter, with a series called Upwards, okay? Upwards. As we looked in Galatians, the fifth chapter, we saw last time we were together uh, the first of the upwards that we're going to encounter in this series about love. But I want to just refresh our memories in Galatians, the fifth chapter. This is uh, going to start in verse number 16, and we're going to read through verse number 23. Galatians, the fifth chapter, verse number 16 says, I say then, walk in the Spirit... And you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Verse 17, for the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. Now, for all of us, our ears should perk up when we hear that statement because there are things in our lives that we wish that we could do that we do not do. And there are things that we wish that we wouldn't do that we find ourselves doing. And right here, the word of God gives us the solution. He says, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. In other words, those things which you wish that you weren't doing, those worldly fleshly things that you're frustrated about in your Christian walk, he says, here's the solution to that, walk in the spirit. Because the flesh is going to lust against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Then he goes on. And uh, he says in verse number 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, verse number 19, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, verse 21, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. In other words, I don't have to list them all for you. You know what they are. They're evident. They're, they're easy to spot. And he says, of the like. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I want you to notice the word practice, because the word practice shows us that these are things that we are getting good at, right? Practice makes perfect. So in other words, if you're unrepentant in your sin, and you're continuing to do these things habitually, uh, you're continually doing these things, and you're practicing at them, then you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. He spells it out plain for us. But then he goes on in the next verse. In verse number 22, he says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. 23, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Now he tells us what these words are. See, the, the words of the flesh we know drag us down. 
Okay, if you think about it this way, the, our, our flesh came out of the earth, right? God formed the man out of the dust of the earth. And therefore, the works of the flesh and fallen humanity, that worldliness, is evident. Those are things that drag us down. Adultery, fornication, hatred, heresies, envies, murder, sorcery, all that kind of stuff will drag us down. But what's going to bring us up, what's going to lift us up, is walking in the Spirit. You think about God as the Spirit. Oftentimes when we think about heaven and where God is, we think of up, right, as opposed to down. We know that down is the flesh, down is the world, down is the way to hell. But up is the way to heaven, up is the way of the Spirit. So these are up words, if you will. Now, just to review our thinking, remember we talked about the first up word being love. And that love is the greatest power in the entire universe, and we understood from John the fourth chapter, first John the fourth chapter, that where it said that God is love. Therefore, if God is love, then love is the greatest force in the universe because God is greater than all other things. And therefore, if God is love, then love becomes the greatest power, that greatest force that we can apply in our lives in order to get through, in order to uh, make things happen, in order to make things work. Now, if you didn't get a hold of that message, I would encourage you to go on the app or go online, that sort of a thing, download it. You can get the CD out there and uh, you can catch up with where we're at. But I want you also to remember this, is that love came first because I believe personally that out of love flows all of the other gifts. Here's the reason why. Because if God is love, right, and and, and the spirit is the spirit of God, right, the Holy Spirit of Christ that lives on the inside of us, then that love is on the inside of us and the fruit of the spirit will produce not only love, but all the other things will flow through that love. We're going to see that tonight as we take a look at our second upward, which is joy. Notice the second word, right after love, comes joy. Now, let's define joy for a second, shall we? Joy is not just mere happiness, even though it looks a lot like it, doesn't it? But joy is different than happiness. Let's talk about happiness for a second. Happiness is something that is based on our circumstances. Maybe there's a a situation that we smile about. We like to feel happy. Maybe there's some sort of a hilarity about a, a, a moment in life. And, and, and we're happy. We start to laugh. We have fun for a second. We, we let our guard down for a second. Maybe happiness comes when you were uh, really waiting for something to happen and finally it came through. You got the promotion. Uh, you, you got a little bonus check in the mail. The Christmas bonus came in. You know, something like that happened and, and, and all of a sudden there was happiness. Maybe, maybe you were saving up for a long time and you were really waiting to buy that special item and then after a while you, you finally realized, hey, I've got enough for it and the taxes and all that kind of stuff. You went down the store and you purchased that item and you were happy about it. Now, we all know that happiness is wonderful, right? We all love to smile. We all love to, to laugh. We all love to have a good time and feel happy. But if you notice, when our happiness is attached to a circumstance or a, uh, a surrounding or a thing, then the moment you remove that circumstance, that surrounding, or that thing, or if any of those uh, circumstantial things change, all of a sudden your happiness can be removed, let me give you an illustration of this. The happiest place on earth is a short 45-minute drive from where we live. Is that right? Okay, everybody's familiar with where we're talking about, okay? And we know that you can go there and you can feel happy as you're riding rides and as you're eating popcorn and, and maybe some of you guys are getting a churro, you know, and, and you've got the turkey leg that's the size of your head and, you know, the kids are, are, are squealing with joy at the sight of the large mouse, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And you're wondering, is that a small Asian woman inside of that mouse? I just don't know. You know, it's just uh, something about that. And and so there's these feelings of happiness. But in the happiest place on earth, have you noticed that your happiness is only temporary? Usually it lasts about a minute and a half to three minutes, about the length of the ride that you were standing in line for. Your happiness, though, did not start when you started that line, did it? Not at all. Why? Because you walked up and you said, an hour and a half for this? What am I doing waiting in this line? Do we want to skip this ride? No, the kids really want to go, honey. Oh, okay, fine. We'll go stand in the line. You go and you stand in the line and everybody's knocking at you, right? If for some reason you're wondering, are these people from another country? Don't they understand personal space? What's going on here? They're crowding me. That kid just sneezed and wiped it on the rail. Kids don't touch that rail, right? And and, and there's all this stuff. And then finally you're, you're getting close and right in the middle of the line when you're the most compacted, one of your kids says, I have to pee, right? And, and all of a sudden you're losing your 
your mind and you send your spouse to take the child to the restroom and you're standing there and finally you, you get a little bit further in the line and then somebody says, I'm hungry, right? And, and do you have the backpack? Well, it was on the stroller and, and all that stuff. Listen, guys, I can tell you my most memorable experiences at the happiest place on earth are not the happy ones. I can tell you the exact place where my, all three of my children, in fact, ruined a whole outfit in their diapers because stuff went all over them. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about, right? And how I had to go and I had to purchase them another outfit. See, happiness is attached to our circumstances. You can be having a happy time in the car with your spouse and all of a sudden a subject comes up and you are no longer happy. Don't laugh too much there, husband. So, okay, just... Not, not you, honey. He's not talking about us. <laughs> Happiness is based on circumstances. You know, you could get that raise and then realize, oh, my electric bill just went up. It's already swallowed up. See, happiness is attached to those things, but joy is something quite different. Joy is a gift that is given to us. Joy is a, a product. It is a fruit of the Spirit that comes when we walk in the Spirit. Now, all of a sudden, we have joy regardless of our circumstances. In other words, you can smile. You can laugh. You can actually feel happy. You can have a joy, that ecstasy, that, that, that wonderful, uh, 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 uplifting joy, no matter what your circumstances are. No matter whether you're in a line at Disneyland and somebody sneezes on your neck or whether you are at home with your family and everything's going great. Doesn't matter if you just got fired, if somebody just punched you in the face. It doesn't matter what happens. You can have the joy of the Lord at any time and at all times as long as you're walking in the Spirit. And I want to take a look at this tonight, but before I do, I want to show you where joy cannot be found, okay, just to drive this point home, because I found this and I thought that it was worth repeating, where joy cannot be found. First of all, joy cannot be found in unbelief. Sometimes people think it would be better if I just wasn't a Christian, if I just didn't believe, you know, Christianity is just a bunch of rules and regulations, it's legalistic, all this kind of stuff, and we would, be, we would be more happy out there in the world just doing whatever we want to do. Sometimes as Christians, we can actually look longingly at the world and think, well, maybe there's some, some pleasure out there in the world. Yeah, there's temporary, but it's not found in unbelief because Voltaire was an infidel of the most pronounced type, and at the end of his life, he wrote, I wish I had never been born. Joy cannot be found in unbelief. Joy cannot be found in pleasure and only pleasure. Lord Byron lived a life full of pleasure, if anyone did, and he wrote, the worm, the canker, and grief are mine alone. Joy cannot be found in money. Sometimes we think, if I only had more money, then I would be joyful. I would be more happy. Yeah, you may be temporarily happy, but Jay Gould, the American millionaire, had plenty of money. And when dying, he said, I suppose I am the most miserable man on the earth. Joy cannot be found in position, and joy cannot be found in fame. Lord Beaconsfield enjoyed more than his share of both position and fame, and yet he wrote, youth is a mistake, manhood is a struggle, and old age is a regret. And finally, joy cannot be found in worldly achievement. Sometimes we think, if I could just get that position, if I could just get some fame, if I could just get some recognition, if I could just get someone to appreciate what I've done, I would be more happy, I'd be more joyful. But it cannot be found in those things because Alexander the Great conquered the known world in his day. And having done so, he wept in his tent before he said, there are no more worlds to conquer. Your joy goes beyond your circumstances. You can have it at any time in any place, anywhere you go, everywhere you go, in every circumstance, you can have joy because it is not based on your circumstances. Joy is a product of the Holy Spirit's work of love in us. Come on, somebody. That's, that's good right there. That's good stuff. Joy is a product of the Holy Spirit's work of love in us. Let me put it to you this way. When you know you're loved, don't you feel good? Oh, man, I could tell you the, the time and the place. I remember, this is actually kind of a fun story. I was on a swing in a park in Redlands on a beautiful day. There was clouds in the sky. It was blue. Birds were actually chirping. Yes. When I first heard my girlfriend at the time say, I love you. Oh, my goodness. I tell you, I, I just had the butterflies. I, I just felt so good. See, when you know that God loves you, it changes the world that you live in. Because joy is a product of the Holy Spirit's work of love in us. John chapter 15, turn there with me. John chapter 15, Jesus is talking to the disciples and he's leaving them with some words before he goes to the cross. 
And in John chapter 15, he leaves these words not only to his disciples, but to you and to me today. John chapter 15, we're going to look at verse number 9 through verse number 11. Look at what Jesus says in John chapter 15, starting in verse number 9. He says, as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. In other words, stay there. Live there. Dwell there in my love. Now look at what he says in the next verse, verse number 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. In other words, the way to stay in my love is to stay in my commandments. The things that I'm delivering to you, the things that I'm telling you, you need to stay there in my commandments. And he says, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So I want you to notice something. There's a theme here. He says, I want you guys to stay in my love just as I have stayed in the Father's love. Two verses, he focuses on, you stay in my love because I've stayed in God's love. Okay, everybody's tracking? Everybody's good? Okay, take a look at the very next verse. I want you to connect these two. Verse number 11. These things I have spoken to you. What has he spoken to you? About the love that he has that we stay in his love just as he stayed in the Father's love. Jesus was always connected to the Father, always loved the Father, right? This is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased, right at the beginning of his ministry when he's baptized in the Jordan. So Jesus was connected to the love of the Father. Now Jesus is telling us, stay connected to my love, okay? These things I have spoken to you that my love, I'm sorry, does he say my love? No, now he switches over, doesn't he? He says that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. In other words, the way that you can have joy in any and every situation is staying connected to the love of the Father through Jesus Christ, his Son. In other words, you may be having a tough time in life, and that's okay. Why? Because you're loved by God. You might be having the worst time of your life, and yet you can still have joy. Why? Because there's a God in heaven who says, I love you. You could be having the worst life ever. You could look around and say, there is no one that's worse off than me. And and, and yet, if you know that you're loved by God, you can still have the joy of the Lord as long as you're staying connected in his spirit. See, joy is a product of the Holy Spirit's work of love in each in every one of us. Let me show this to you again. Romans chapter 14, verse 17, very familiar verse. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. In other words, he says it's not about your natural surroundings. We would think on the earth, like the book of Ecclesiastes, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, right? That's happiness. We connect food with happiness. We connect drink with happiness. If we could just have the right surroundings, we would be happy. But the kingdom of God is not our surroundings. The kingdom of God is not our physical things. It's not our money. It's not our food. It's not our drink. It's not our homes. It's not our clothes. It's not our friends. It's not. No, the kingdom of God, look at what it says, is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, the right will and the right way of God, and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what the kingdom of God is. You know what that means? When we get to heaven and when we look around, it's going to be a very joyful place. There's going to be people walking around with smiles on their face. There's no ho-humming in heaven. So if we are a part of that kingdom here and now on the earth, then to bring that kingdom to the earth, we need to have the joy of the Lord. Oh, come on. Some of you guys need to stir it up tonight. See, that's why many people don't want to become Christians is because they don't see the joy in our life because we're not allowing the love of the Father to flow through us in the joy. See, the kingdom of God that we bring is not a kingdom of sourpuss sucking on lemon type of Christianity. This is, can I tell you something? God saved me from the pit of hell and I'm happy about it. Let me tell you something. It doesn't matter what I go through. Yes, the world may be going to hell in a handbasket. Somebody might have flushed the cosmic toilet and we all feel like we're swirling around the big bowl down. The, the proverbial stuff may have just hit the proverbial fan, but I don't care about none of that because I'm not a part of this world. I'm a part of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. See, when you've got the love of the Father living on the inside of you, when you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, you can have joy. In fact, I've got a little quote that I want you to write down that anytime you're wondering 
about your joy level, right? Because Jesus said that your joy may be what? Full, right? That shows me that your joy could be less than full. Some of you guys might be running on E. Hello? Some of you guys walked into this place tonight running on E. And you were saying, Lord, I need to hear your voice. I need to be encouraged tonight. I'm here to show you something. I got a little quote for you that you can talk to yourself. Do you know you can talk to yourself? Sometimes it's good. You say, people will think I'm crazy. Good. Let them. Right? Because it's the crazy people that are going to get stuff done. It's the crazy people that are going to think outside of the box of this world and start to operate in the joy of the Lord. So you guys need to understand that this is what we, we need to do. I am loved by God and I live in his kingdom, so I have joy. That's the quote for each and every one of us. Can you say that with me? Okay, I am loved by God and live in his kingdom, so I have joy. Let's say that one more time. I am loved by God and I live in his kingdom, so I have joy. See, when you can get a hold of the joy of the Lord, when you understand that the joy of the Lord it comes from his love. When you understand that Jesus went to the cross for love's sake, because he loved you so much that even if you were the only person that ever lived on this planet, that he would have still died just for you, to save you. That God could not stand the thought of eternity without you. And that he created you for love's sake. And yet because of that same love's sake that he became poor, he emptied himself of his glory, he condescended to the earth and he came in the form of a man and that he went to the cross and he died for you and for me. See, when you realize that extravagant love, that there's no greater love that any man could ever have than that he would lay down his life for his friends and now Jesus says, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. When you understand you have a friend in the Father, when you understand that I have the love of the Father, when you understand the Holy Spirit is now in my heart and he shed his love abroad inside of me, now all of a sudden you can smile and you can have the joy of the Lord. I am loved by God and live in his kingdom so I have joy. Sometimes you got to talk to yourself. Sometimes you got to stir it up. Sometimes you got to stoke the flames, right? Sometimes that flame will die down and your joy won't be full. It'll start, start to grow cold. But see, all you got to do is blow on it, right? Just, just a little, little can start to stoke a fire. In the same way, when you start to speak the word of God, when you start to declare the promises of God, I am loved by God. God loves me so much, he wouldn't, he wouldn't stand eternity without me. Wow, now all of a sudden the joy of the Lord starts to rise up. You start filling up the tank. Can you say amen? amen? See, when you operate in joy, it provides strength. When you operate in joy, it provides strength. I'm going to show this to you in the word, Nehemiah chapter 8. Turn there with me. The book of Nehemiah, they have just finished completing the wall, and now all of a sudden they've gone to other tasks. They read the book of the law to the people. As they are reading the book of the law, people start to realize we haven't been following the will and the way of the Lord. And they start to weep. I mean, it impacts them so deeply that people are crying, they're wailing, they've realized that they've forsaken God, they realize why they were in captivity, why they were, you know, not having a, a good experience. And so here they are wailing and crying before the Lord. In Nehemiah chapter 8, we're going to take a look at verse number 10. They start to give some instructions. Nehemiah Chapter number 8 and verse number 10, the, the priests start to quiet the people and they tell them, don't mourn and don't weep. Verse number 10, then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared for this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, look at this, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So in other words, what he's saying to them is that as you start to rejoice in the Lord, see, we could look at life and we could start to get down on ourselves. We could start to weep. You know, we could hear the word of the Lord and we could start to see, man, I really need to change. And you know what? It's okay to have a godly sorrow because godly sorrow leads to repentance, which leads to everlasting life. But we don't weep as the world weeps. No, we start to come together and we realize, hey, I'm going to change. I, I, I got that principle in my life. I'm going to start living according to that. God loves me and I'm a part of his kingdom. I can have the promises that he says I can have. I, I can do what he says I can do. That's where he says, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. And don't sorrow. Why? For the joy of the Lord is your strength. 
See, when you start to operate in that joy, now all of a sudden it gives you the power to, 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 to endure. It starts to give you the strength. You might say, well, how does it do that? Here's how. Joy focuses us on the outcome and motivates us to endure. See, joy will turn your attention from the surrounding, from the temporal, right? It'll take your attention off of those things that were linked to our happiness. And joy will turn us towards the ultimate outcome, and it will give us the motivation we need to endure. Okay? Now, Jesus is our example, right? Jesus came and he lived the perfect life. And, and he's the, the captain of our salvation. He's the one that goes out before us, right? He's the one who's calling us to follow in his footsteps. And so Jesus left us an example. And we see in Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 2, we were just there on our weekend messages. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 2, turn there with me. I want you to see this, okay? Talks about we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses in verse number 1. It says, let us run our race with endurance. And then it tells us how to do it in verse number 2. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 2. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Now look at this, who for the what? Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So for Jesus, Jesus had circumstances that were not necessarily happy, right? Where we could all say, my goodness, Jesus endured crazy circumstances, Jesus was rejected by men. Jesus was scorned. Jesus was mocked. Jesus had uh, unlawful trials. Jesus was beaten to a bloody pulp. Jesus was nailed to a cross. Jesus was whipped. Jesus was clo- He didn't have anything when he died. He didn't have any followers. He didn't have nothing. Strike the, the shepherd and the sheep will scatter, right? They all had forsaken him. They were all gone. And here was Jesus. Here was, he was despised and rejected, cruelly mocked and scorned, put before kings. And yet, here Jesus is going through all that. Why? For the joy that was set before him. See, Jesus had a motivating factor in his life that caused him to go through it. So in the Garden of Gethsemane, you see him saying, Father, if there's any other way, let's do the other way. Because this, this trial, this, this scourging, this mocking, this, this painful beating that I'm about to endure, it, it's a lot, God. If there's any other way. And yet he says, not my will but yours be done. How did he do that? How did he commit himself to the will of the Father? For the joy that was set before him. You know, in the book of Isaiah, it says that he saw your face. Isn't that amazing? That there on the cross, God in the flesh saw your face. You and me, we are the joy that was set before him. In other words, his joy was each and every one of us. His joy was that he would get to be with us forever and ever. His joy was that his creation didn't have to suffer in hell for eternity, but that we can now be reconnected to God and that we could be loved by God, we could be connected to God, and we could commune and have a wonderful relationship with God for our life here on earth and on into eternity. That was the joy that motivated Jesus to endure the cross, despise its shame, and go and sit at the right hand of the Father waiting for the expectation of Christ, you and me and everybody else who would follow. That's worth a great big amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, not only does joy focus on the outcome and motivate us to endure, joy also replaces sorrow and pain with the pleasure of God. Joy will replace sorrow and pain with the pleasure of God. Jesus told us a parable about his own death and resurrection. But the principle that we see in this parable applies to each and every one of us. Turn back with me to the book of John, this time to John chapter 16. Jesus actually had a lot to say about our joy. In fact, if you read John chapter 14, 15, and 16, and you can find out about what the words of Jesus were about this. So we don't have time tonight to cover all of this. But in John chapter 16, he tells just a little one-verse parable, real quick. John chapter 16, verse number 21. Jesus always used examples. He always used parables in his teaching. And so here he is, and he just gives them a quick little snapshot, quick little example for them to grasp what was about ready to take place. He talks to them about he's going to go to the Father, and they're going to be sad. They're they're not going to like the fact that Jesus is gone. Can you imagine the disciples for a second? Let's just go there for a second, shall we? Can you imagine the disciples? Here they are. 
Here they have encountered God in the flesh. That in itself is amazing. Here they've seen his miracles. That in itself is amazing. Here they are, they've, they've had their own moments with Jesus. Each and every one of them probably had numerous, there's, there's plenty of them that were recorded in the Bible, teachable moments where they were just blown away, where they, they marveled. They were in awe. They saw his glory. They, they saw the dead raised. They saw the lame walk. They heard his teaching. They, they grew during those years that they were walking with Jesus. And here Jesus starts to tell them, I'm leaving, guys. You're not going to be with me anymore. It's not going to be like this anymore. All of us would have said, no way, Jesus. Wherever you're going, I have to go too. I can't be away from I can't be apart from you. And Jesus says, don't worry, guys. I, I, I'm going to go to the Father. And if you realize what I was saying when I go to the Father, you would rejoice because my Father's greater than I am. You would be happy that I'm going to the Father and connecting to the Father. And don't worry, guys, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit to be with you so that it's not just one me on the earth, but now I can be inside of every believer, and now we can be connected just as you guys have connected with me this way. Now we can connect this way. And so Jesus says, you guys should be happy about this. And then he gives them a little illustration. In John chapter number 16, and in John chapter number 16, in verse number 21, he says this. He says, a woman... When she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. Many of you parents in this place know that sorrow, right? I remember when uh, we were having our daughter, as she's our oldest, our first child, and my wife's water broke. I was jumping up and down. I was so happy. I was so excited. A baby's coming. A baby's coming. And my wife is yelling at me, get me a towel. You know, like we just... And here we go to the doctor, right, and, and, and we're so excited, and it's all fresh, and it's all new, and then the pain hit, right? See, a woman, when she's in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. In other words, there's going to be some anguish. There's going to be some pain. There's going to be excruciating things that are about ready to take place. And no one looks forward to that because, see, by the time the second one came around, there came a moment where that pain hit, and she's going, where is the epidural? Come on, somebody. Where is that nurse? Call her in. I, just right here. I'm ready to go. Clean it up. Let's do this thing, right? See, we're very blessed in our day and age that we can do that kind of stuff. But see, back in this time, they didn't have any of that. See, there was sorrow because she knew her hour had come. There was about to be something that was going to go on. But he goes on in the verse, and look at what he says. He says, but as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. I can tell you that for all of our children, the moment that child came into the world, we weren't thinking about the pain. We weren't thinking about the contractions. We weren't thinking about ice chips. We weren't thinking about Lamas and breathing and all that. No, all we could think about was baby. Oh my goodness, look at the miracle that's being weighed on the table over there. Look at this little bundle of joy that they just placed in my wife's arm. Look at this that just changed our life forever. See, it's the same way in our lives. You may be facing something that you don't want to go through. You might be looking at a job that for you is painful, stressful, difficult, hard. You might be looking at relationships and family situations. Maybe you just came through them at Christmas time. And you're wondering, how are we ever going to recover from that fight? You, you might be looking at your health, or maybe you're looking at the future with uncertainty. And maybe there's things that you know that you have to do, that you know are going to be painful in life. And yet, if you can focus on the love of God, that God loves me and I live in his kingdom, then you can have the joy. Because the moment that thing is birthed in your life, you're not even going to remember the pain that you went through. All you're going to know is that I've got my promise from God. I, I've got a God that loves me. I've got a God that's faithful. I've got the kingdom of God. I've got the peace of God. I, I have the Holy Spirit on the inside of me. See, it just changes the world that you live in. And now, no longer is your happiness just a part of circumstantial life. But now, you have a joy that supersedes all of that. You know, it just amazes me how many times we see pain, trials, and sorrows in the Bible accompanied with joy. 
It was a fascinating study for me today. I wish I could just go through all the verses like in the book of James chapter 1. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Romans chapter 5, verse number 3. Uh, we glory in tribulations because we know that they produce character in us. I mean, on and on and on and on and on throughout the Bible. I want to just show you two of them. First one is this. In Psalm 126, verse number 5, it says, Those who sow in tears shall reap with joy. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Those who sow in tears shall reap with joy. In other words, don't let temporary pain, temporary trials, temporary tears get you off your track because you're going to come reaping with joy. When you get that pleasure, when you get that, that sorrow place now, all of a sudden that seed that you sowed that you let go of, that thing that you had to let go of and let die, it's going to come back to you in greater measure. God's going to restore to you that thing that you sowed. And you don't have to worry about it. You can have joy all through the process because God is good and his word is true. Are you listening tonight? The second one I want to look at is this, 1 Thessalonians, they're there in the New Testament, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Okay, right after Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, you'll find 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Thessalonica. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse number 6, he's kind of telling them their own story. It's kind of neat to see how the gospel came to them, things that took place. And in verse number six of chapter one, verse Thessalonians, it says this, and you became followers of us and of the Lord. Now, I have read this verse numerous times throughout my life. I have, I've read it probably every year of my life. And as I read that verse, I just kind of skip over that part, not really thinking about what he's saying. Think about the Lord Jesus Christ, all right? If we're gonna follow the Lord and the Lord suffered, how many of you know we're gonna have to suffer? Right? But not only the Lord, but he says you became followers of us. Now, let me ask you a question. Did the Apostle Paul suffer? Yeah. Oh, yeah, he did. Oh, yeah, he did. In fact, you can read in First and Second Corinthians all the sufferings and all the trials that he went through. Snake bick. He was shipwrecked. He was in the deep for a number of days, nights. He, he had persecutions. They stoned him. They dragged him out of the city thinking he was dead. He had persecutions. He had all kinds of stuff going on. All sorts of things that happened to him. He had to be lowered out of the window of a city in a basket because people were, were going to kill him. They, you can read in the book of Acts that people were fasting until they killed Paul. They weren't going to eat anything until Paul was dead. Those were the kind of persecutions he went through. So when he says to the church at Thessalonica, he's not just saying you became followers of the Bible and doing what the Bible said. No, you became followers of us. Now let's look at the rest of the verse and see if that is true. Having received the word in much affliction. In other words, you really became followers of us because you received the word not in church service in sunny Southern California, and you know, you get to carry your Bible home, and, and everything's hunky-dory, you got all kinds of great people around you, new friends, new family, new stuff, no, in much affliction. In other words, when they received the gospel, they were hated for it. When they received the gospel, there were people saying, you shouldn't do that. What are you, stupid? You're crazy. Why would you want to give your life to that? And, and, and there was all kinds of stuff, in much affliction, but look at what he says, with joy, of the Holy Spirit. In other words, your circumstances don't have to govern whether or not you have joy. Because if somebody can receive the gospel in much affliction and still have joy, then how much more when I go to work and the boss is mean, can I still have joy? How much more when I go home and my spouse isn't on the same page, can I still have joy? How much more when I, I'm looking at my kids and I'm having an argument about something that we've already talked about 50 times that morning, can I have joy? See, you don't have to have your circumstances attached to your bank account. They don't have to be attached to your car. They don't have to be attached to your home. They don't have to be attached to your neighborhood. They don't have to be attached to the political system who's in office, who's out of office, who's going to have office. It doesn't have to be any of that stuff. Your joy is attached to one and one only. It's the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of you and loves you. No matter what circumstances we find ourselves in, when you know you're loved... And when you know you're living in the kingdom of God, walking in the spirit, you can have joy. That's why the apostle Paul in Philippians chapter four, verse number four, says rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. We gotta be reminded of that. Joy isn't upward. As you walk in the spirit, 
you will have the joy of the Lord. Do you guys got the joy of the Lord tonight? Come on, let's rejoice. Let's give the Lord a great big praise. Woo! God is so good. Tonight, we're going to go with the joy of the Lord. Before we do that, I want to talk to anybody who's here. Maybe tonight, you have not yet gotten connected with God. Some of you in this place, you think that you're connected with God, but you're not. And I want to talk to you about that. I want to make sure before you leave this place that your heart is right with God, that you are headed for heaven, and that you're not headed for hell. You know, recently we, we've seen several celebrities, people, prominent figures in our society, musicians and actresses, and different people that died. I'm going to ask everybody who remains seated during this time. The church is not done yet, and your eternal life's at stake. The devil's trying to distract you right now. Because some of you in this place, if you died tonight, you would go to hell, and you wouldn't go to heaven. So I want to make sure, and I'm letting you know how serious this is, so that you don't get distracted, but that you take it seriously. So I'm going to ask everybody, please give me a couple minutes of your time, then we'll let you go. But right now, it's, is it worth your eternity to have to get up and leave? Don't let anything distract you. Tonight I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to answer the question honestly in your heart. And how you answer this question is going to tell you a lot about where you're at with God. I don't think anyone in this place is excited about going to hell. No one would say, I want to go to hell. Party on. No one's that foolish. No one's that dumb. Some of you guys know that you're disconnected from God and that if you died at this very moment that you would go to hell. Okay, and we'll deal with you guys. We'll talk to you guys. But some of you in this place, you need to hear this question because you don't know where you're at or you think you know that you're connected with God when really you're in a trap and you're not. And a trap that you're in that you don't know about, you will stay in. And wouldn't the devil be happy to keep you deceived and to have you end up in hell rather than have you have the pleasure of God forever? Here's the question. What makes you think you're going to heaven? It's just that simple. Just answer that question in your heart. No, 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 the answer, but you and God. What makes you think you're going to heaven? Some of you say, well, I think I'm going to go to heaven because all roads lead to heaven. You know, Jesus went to the cross and God loves us. Therefore, all roads lead to heaven now. God's okay with whatever. You do your thing, I'll do my thing. It's all good. You know, the different churches out there, they have different ways of going, and that's good for them. God appreciates all of us. And all roads lead to heaven. You know that nowhere in the Bible does it say all roads lead to heaven? It's not there. It's like me saying, all roads lead to the moon. Just drive around the earth as long as you want, you'll make it. No, you won't. The same way, what makes us think after Jesus goes to the cross, so specifically, after he suffers and dies, what makes us think after all that, that he would say, whatever, I really don't care. But he cared enough to go to the cross, cared enough to endure a beating, Cared enough to endure the suffering and the anguish. And now he's going to say whatever? No, he tells us exactly how to get to heaven right here in his word. Sometimes people think, well, you know, I think I'm going to go to heaven because I was raised in church. My parents told me we were Christians growing up. Hung a cross for St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized or christened as a child. Went to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, maybe Sabbath school class. You always considered yourself to be a Christian. Born in America, America is a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religion. We're not Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus. We're Christians, right? Wrong. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say because your parents raised you in church, tell you you're a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you wear religious jewelry, that if you attend religious classes, or that because you're born in America, that you get to go to heaven. Nowhere. And nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're not some other religion, that by default, God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. So what makes you think you're going to heaven? Sometimes people say, well, I think I'm going to heaven because I was here tonight. You know, I'm sitting in church right here in front of you, and, and doesn't that mean that I'm a Christian? I consider myself to be a Christian. I don't identify with anything else. And while I'm glad that you're here tonight, did you know that nowhere in the Bible so you just sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian? It's like me saying, you know what? I really want to be on the Lakers basketball team. 
you know, they've been doing pretty good lately. And, and I think I could add to the team. And so I, I'm going to go and buy a Lakers uniform, go down to Staples Center in Los Angeles, sit there on the side of the court, right? Bring a, bring a basketball and think that I'm going to get to play in the game. You know what's going to happen? Get, come game time, they're going to find me sitting there, drag me out and lock me up. Why? Because I'm not a member of the Lakers organization. In the same way, you can't just sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, and that makes you a Christian. In fact, there's a story in the Bible about a wedding feast. There's people who are brought in, and one guy's there, and he's not wearing wedding clothes, and they take him out, even though he was at the feast. See, sometimes we think, well, you know, all you got to do is sit in church service, call yourself a Christian. No, no one in the Bible say, call yourself a Christian, sit in church, that makes you a Christian. Sometimes people think, well, hold on a second, Pastor, because, you know, my last church I got involved, I helped out, I sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I, I got a membership card to that church, even taught in the Bible classes. Doesn't that mean that I'm a Christian? Doesn't that mean that I'm headed for heaven because I got involved in church? Well, no, did you know that nowhere in the Bible just say because you get involved in church, you go to heaven? Nowhere in the Bible say God is looking for your volunteer hour sheet. For how much you did there at church. No one in the Bible just say that because you have a membership card that you get to go to heaven. God's not looking for your membership card at the gates of heaven before you can enter. Tonight, I love you enough to tell you the truth. Sometimes people think if we can just be good enough, well, you know what? It's, it's not just about going to church. It's just about being good. You know, and I've been really good. I've helped people out. I used to be bad, but I cleaned up my act, and now I, I've been really good lately, and, and I think God sees that and appreciates that. Gotten involved in social justice causes. I'm wearing shoes that help kids out across the world. Uh, I'm drinking water that digs wells in, in underprivileged parts of, of, the, of the world. And doesn't that mean that I'm a Christian? Well, did you know that nowhere in the Bible say you can just be good enough to get into heaven? There's nowhere in the Bible say how good you have to be. Because the standard to get into heaven based on your own merit, on your own goodness, is perfection. And there's not one who is perfect. Not one except Jesus. And our goodness compared to God's goodness is like filthy rags, the Bible says. Going to get thrown out, not going to get to stay. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You're not going to make it based on your own goodness. Sometimes people think, but I know God. I mean, I, 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 I know who God is. And, and I celebrate Christmas, sing the songs every year of my life, celebrate the resurrection around Easter time every year. I mean, doesn't that mean that I'm a Christian because I, I know who God is? I can quote scriptures, Old and New Testament. Doesn't that mean that I'm a Christian? Well, no, if you'd read your Bible, you'd know the demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. The devil himself, you can read about it in your Bible, knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures out of his mouth. And yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up here at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. It's not about having some mental ascent towards God, knowing who Jesus is, and that gets you right with God. But rather, this is about your heart. Here's how God outlines in his word to get to heaven. And there's no other way. There's only one way, and it's God's way. Jesus said these words in John, the third chapter. He said, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. It's just that simple. You must be born again. Now, I know some of you guys are thinking, oh, I saw that on a movie. Oh, you're one of those. Oh, my goodness. I read about that in a blog on the Internet. Yeah, but listen, let's not let the world, Hollywood movies, television books, and the internet define for us what being born again is. Let's let the Bible do that for us, shall we? What does being born again really mean from the Bible? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's just that simple. It's all or nothing but Jesus. Let me prove it to you. Last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Now, that's pretty gross, pretty graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, wouldn't you say? But lukewarm, what is he talking about? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and again, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to have everybody bow their heads and close their eyes and just take a look inside. You've already asked yourself that question. You already know the answer. Some of you guys answered and said, I wouldn't make it. Some of you guys answered and said, I hope I'd make it. I think I'd make it. Maybe I'd make it. You know where you're at with God. There's only one way. And if it's not that you're born again, then you're not headed for heaven. You're headed for hell. And tonight, you can make a change. As I ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes, I'm going to ask you to think about that question one more time. Identify where you're at. 
And then I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. And I'm going to pop my hands together. Bang. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that. Bang. That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying something. You're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, head of heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Jesus said these words. He said, if you confess me before man, I'll confess you before my father. I'm a man. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. But he said, if you deny me, I will deny you. Tonight, your call. Tonight, your choice. Will you give God all of your heart? Will you give God all of your life? And then after I count all those hands, then I'm going to ask you to come forward. We're going to pray together to receive Jesus because you don't get born again just by simply raising your hand. God's a gentleman. He won't come in. He won't steal it. He won't connive it. He won't try and talk you out of it. No, you've got to invite him into your life, give him all of your heart and all of your life. And tonight, if you want to be included in that prayer, get ready to get your hand up. Who should raise their hand in a moment? Have you been running from God instead of to you? God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Tonight is your night. Make sure. Who should raise your hand if you've never done this before, never said yes to Jesus, given him all of your heart and all of your life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place and you know you wouldn't make it, you know that's the condition of your heart. Come on, get ready to get your hand up. Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes all across this auditorium, back in the families, wherever you're at, watching by television in the foyer, down at the Love Rock Cafe, or online, wherever you're at, watching across the nation and around the world. Get ready to get your hands up. Come on, everybody, bow your heads. Close your eyes at this time. Take a look inside. What makes you think you're going to heaven? If you say, I'm, I'm not, I just know I'm not. You said, I think, hope, maybe. You said, I, 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 I don't know why. Any reason other than I've been born again. Then get ready to get your hands up. If that's you, I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Get ready to get your hands up. All together on the count of three if you need to. One, two, Three, let me see your hands. Raise them up high right now. There's one, two, three, four. Thank you. Five. There's six over here. Thank you. God bless you. Six. Who else tonight? There's six wise people already. Who else tonight? Who else tonight? Raise it up high for me if I didn't already see it. That's you. Just raise it up high right now. There's six. There's seven back there. Thank you. God bless you. There's eight right here. Got you over here. God bless you. Eight on this side. Where are you at? Raise it up high. That's you. Anybody else real quick? There's nine on this side. Thank you. God bless you. Who else tonight? Anybody else? Back here. Back here. Thank you. Number 10. Got you over there. Got you over there. Anybody else real quick on this side? Who else? Who else real quick? Nine or 10 wise people. Anybody else real quick? Want to make sure because we're going to pray together. If you want to be included in that prayer, giving God all your heart and all of your life, I want to make sure. I want to make sure tonight. Just raise it up high. Come on. If that's you. Anybody else real quick? About 10 wise people. Anybody else? You want to be included in that prayer. Last call, and then we're going to pray together, okay? Anybody else? Thank you. Number 11. Anybody else? Thank you. Number 12. I got you back there. God bless you. All right, let's give the Lord a hand for about a dozen wise people. Amen. All right, let's do this. I want to lead you in that prayer. So if you raise your hand, or you should have raised your hand. It's not too late. Get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Okay, if you brought your family with you, gather up your family. And I want to pray with you tonight. So let's all stand. And if you raise your hand, or you should have raised your hand. Get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight. Okay? You come right now. Come on down to the front. Come on down to the front. Come on, they're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. You can come too. If your children raise their hand, they're welcome at this time. Bring them forward right now. This is their time too. Anybody else, if you need to come, just come on to the front right now. This is your time. This is your moment. front look up here for a second put a big smile on your face okay you're about ready to receive the holy spirit on the inside you're gonna be born again that means that you can have joy that's awesome isn't it this is the best decision of your entire life right here right now it's awesome it's awesome all right like i said i'm gonna lead you in that prayer 
So prayer is simply talking to God. Okay, we're going to put our hearts on the Lord. Now, this is not about the words of your mouth. If you fumble on a couple words, it's okay, all right? This is about the expression of your heart right now. So I want you to put your hearts on the Lord. Let's all bow our heads once again. Let's close our eyes. Everybody's going to join in with us. And I want you to raise your hand. Or if you should have raised your hand, but you're still out there, you can pray this prayer with us online. If you raise your hand, you can pray this prayer right now. Say, Father God, I come to you now in Jesus' name. I give you all of my heart and all my life. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me of my past wrongs. Wash me and cleanse me with your blood. Make me brand new and fill me now with your Holy Spirit, whom I receive now in Jesus' name. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He came, that He died. And he was raised again to life just for me. Thank you, Jesus. Let it be known that from this day on, I am a Christian. I'm headed for heaven, leaving hell behind. I have the joy of the Lord, and I am in the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Come on, let's lift up a great big shout to the Lord. Right. Hey, everybody. Now that you're a Christian, what do you do next? Okay, we want to help you with that. Okay, so right over here to my right, your left, this is Pastor Joel waving at you. Pastor Joel wants you to just take you guys right over there. Nothing weird's going to go on, okay? He's cool. He's just going to give you some free information, some free literature to help find out what to do next in your walk with God. And then he's going to introduce you to a program we have here called Spiritual Personal Trainers. He'll describe how it works. It's easy. It's free. You need to do it, and then I'll let you come right back out. Your friends and family will wait for you, okay? Hey, Welcome to the family of God. We love you guys. All right, so if you guys make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise tonight.